I think you'll be more than familiar with the broad structure of these, but a very warm welcome to Lord McConnell of Glens Corrisdale. Um, a former First Minister of Scotland, I think the longest serving First Minister, um, we are anxious in this Brexit devolution inquiry to try and sound all shades of opinion um, within each devolved nation, um, also to take the mind of our colleagues who have been very generous with their time in the different parts of this inquiry, and we are extremely grateful to you for coming this afternoon. Um, I think you all know the usual rules of engagement. This is a public evidence session. We will webcast it and we'll send you a transcript for any factual corrections. Perhaps I could also say at this point that um, certainly the way we would see it, and I'm sure you can certainly affect this because you're here, is um, to have a continuing relationship with you through this quite challenging period for, for the British system and approach to these issues. So what you say today is useful. What you may wish to add in the future will be equally useful. And please keep in touch with the committee, and we'd like you to do that. So having said that, if I may, and you're ready, we'll kick off with the first question, which is to ask you for your reaction to the Prime Minister's Lancaster House speech <coughs> and then the white paper. We have, of course, other white papers coming out this week. We may return to some of those in a minute. But basically, what you have seen so far of the UK government's approach to Brexit negotiations, and in particular the political, economic and legal implications to Scotland and the other devolved nations, if you want to add a comment on them, of the UK's government's approach to Brexit. Thank you very much. Well, uh, first of all, thank you uh, very much, Lord Bozo, for this opportunity. My apologies that I was not able to uh, attend the committee on an earlier date. No, we are. But uh, uh, I was very keen to, to give evidence, and I really appreciate this uh, opportunity to do so. Um, I should probably say for the record that I am not, unfortunately, now the longest serving First Minister and was overtaken by my, uh, by my successor. But I, I am still the youngest, um, and so I will, uh, uh, and that includes Miss Sturgeon. Uh, so I will, uh, uh, I will retain that until someone who was under the age of 41 takes on the position in the future. Um, I, uh, I wanted to, 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 in addressing this first question, um, make a few general remarks that I'm sure you will come back to in, in, in other, other questions. But it seems to me that we have a really quite critical situation emerging now as a result of uh, the vote last year um, and the government's strategy as it has developed, including in the Lancaster House speech, um, and then of, obviously subsequently the speech from the, from the First Minister. Uh, and I worry, uh, I worry deeply that uh, the uh, polarisation of the two positions, uh, the, the UK government and the Scottish government, uh, could lead to uh, some real problems further down the line in Scotland, given the implications for uh, the legislative responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament uh, and the implications, I think, for um, uh, the Scottish economy, uh, uh, not just in relation to another independence referendum, but more generally by, by the amount of uh, detail that will have to be covered uh, by them between now and the Great Repeal Bill and uh, the other actions that will come out of the Brexit negotiations. Um, and I think there are a number of fundamental principles here. Um, uh, I would say, first of all, that, the, 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 I think the Prime Minister laid out a very clear strategy in that Lancaster House speech. Um, I have to say that I, for one, believed from the moment that the vote took place last June that it was uh, logical for the UK to then decide if it was going to remove the jurisdiction of the European Court, um, to, to have, UK would have to leave the single market and ultimately, almost certainly, the customs union as well. Um, so I didn't think that her speech was a top, much of a surprise, to be honest, and I think it's a logical strategy, given where we are. Uh, we may not want to be there, many of us, but given where we are, I think that's clear. And within that speech, she does make a positive reference to Scotland. But I think, um, if, if I can say this, yet again, and this has been the tradition with the last four Prime Ministers, 
Um, that statement is couched in very defensive terms about the United Kingdom, um, rather than stressing the potential and the possibility that this new situation might, uh, might provide um, for the diversity of what is the modern-day United Kingdom. Um, and I think, uh, therefore, when you have the First Minister's response um, to indicate that she wants to have another uh, independence referendum, um, uh, that, again, is perhaps predictable, but it, it means that there is a, a, almost no discussion on either side, no reference on either side, to the great detail that needs to be addressed here, uh, not least because of the specific circumstances in Scots law uh, that will be affected by all of this. So it, it does seem to me, and I'll, I'll just summarise this very briefly, I, um, you know, I think that the, the two governments really need to take a, a different approach to this, and I hope that in the weeks to come, uh, they, would, they would look at this. I think, first of all, because of the intransigence of the two positions and the claim and counterclaim that will result from that in every meeting that takes place, I think there needs to be even more transparency about the process of intergovernmental discussions within the United Kingdom than there is in Whitehall or between the UK and the EU. I think all of the papers that are discussed between the Scottish Government and the UK Government should be published and I think there should be open access to them. Um, secondly, I think the discussions that take place should respect the current devolution statement settlement, and that should be a firm position of both of the two governments before they get started. And I think that would then produce, in terms of stability and the allocation of powers, a fairly straightforward process. But where there is a dispute, thirdly, I think there should be some kind of independent adjudication um, of disputes over the allocation of powers within that settlement without needing to refer to the Supreme Court. It should be possible through perhaps some sort of judicial appointment or something of that sort uh, to have an, at least an independent view uh, where there is a dispute over the allocation of powers as a result of the repatriation from Brussels. Um, fourthly, I think there needs to be active engagement on cooperation in the post-Brexit world so that if, for example, all of the powers on fisheries are devolved to the Scottish Parliament, as would be the case under the current devolution settlement, there should be immediately set up a cooperative arrangement on the UK basis so that Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England can discuss a common fisheries policy for the UK. And again, that would seem to me to be entirely logical um, and straightforward if, it's, if it was agreed at an early date. Fifthly, I think there needs to be urgent injection of capacity, and I would include in that uh, transfers between the two governments of civil servants so that there were UK civil servants embedded in the Scottish Government and Scottish Government civil servants embedded in the, uh, those working on Brexit in the UK Government, but with additional capacity, um, and certainly in some of the legal side, um, in both governments to deal with the aspects for Scots law. Uh, and finally, and I think this perhaps uh, comes to the nub of your question, um, I think everybody has to, has to I think, fully understand that if there are going to be special arrangements for Northern Ireland, and there have to be special arrangements for Northern Ireland as a result of these discussions, then it is simply not true to say that there will be one solution for the whole of the United Kingdom. And therefore, there needs to be some flexibility in relation to Scotland and perhaps Wales as well. Chairman, good afternoon, Lord McConnell. <coughs> um, well, your introduction has led into the next series of questions, really, which are attempting to probe in a bit more detail to what extent um, a, a bespoke arrangement can be, be uh, provided for the devolved nations. I mean, the, the Prime Minister has said on a number of occasions she, she would like to reach a Brexit agreement that works for the whole of the UK. So the first question is really, so far do you think she's delivered on that undertaking? Uh, then, a little bit more specifically, I mean, is it possible to respect that referendum result um, whilst taking account of the divergent views of the nations, particularly if I might be frank and say if one government is, has got two agendas? Um, and, I mean, is it possible, and I think you've hinted to, uh, about it with reference to Northern Ireland, is it possible to have differentiated relationships in other parts of the UK in addition to Northern Ireland? Or is a single arrangement the only solution? Well, I think in the same way as, as um, you know, we can look across uh, the European Union 
through the decades and find examples of flexibility in uh, joining criteria or uh, you know the, the, the implementation of specific parts of bits of legislation or even something on the treaties um, to accommodate different points of view. Uh, you know, I think to me, the, to me, the UK, the modern UK, the 21st century UK, is a, is a, is a, is even more than it ever was before a shared sovereignty uh, uh, operation. And and in that situation, you have to take account of, I think, the fact that uh, there are um, uh, significant powers properly devolved, but devolved on the understanding that they will not be interfered with in both in Scotland, Wales and in, and in Northern Ireland when the, when the executive there is operating. Um, but we also have that background of the situation in Northern Ireland. And nobody, nobody is suggesting that there will not be some flexibility in Northern Ireland here across the border with uh, uh, the Republic. And um, if there can be some flexibility for Northern Ireland, then it's not out, w out with the, the, uh, the brain power of the British government to, th to, to find accommodations in some sense with some of the aspirations that are in Scotland. Now, that is not to say that you can be a member of the UK single market and a member of the EU single market if the UK single market and the EU single market become two distinct and different operations. You know, so I think the idea that Scotland could stay part of the single market while still being part of the UK is, you know, I don't, I don't think is, is at all legally possible, never mind uh, uh, in any other way realistic. Um, but I do think on other issues it should be possible to give some indication to the fact that um, in Scotland there was a very clear political expression um, that was not just in the public vote but across the five uh, main political parties in Scotland that there was, a, there, was a, there was a closer relationship with Europe and with some of the ideals of the European Union than perhaps was the case elsewhere in the UK. Um, and I think the British government would be very wise to find ways of accommodating that, not in a defensive, negative, fearful sense, but in a positive sense that celebrates the diversity of the shared sovereignty of the UK. So I think it is possible to do it. It just needs effort and goodwill. Have you any particular areas in mind that would be, as it were, obvious candidates for a differentiated settlement? Well, one that's, I mean, one that's, uh, I, 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 would, I would have to, I give you two examples. Uh, I, I would say perhaps that might um, one of one one which already exists and one which I think could exist. Um, uh, there is already uh, in Scotland a slightly different set of criteria on some of the um, uh, immigration categories um, for visas, for work visas, and so on. Um, the graphics. Partly reflects the different demographics in Scotland and uh, you know economic challenges in Scotland and so on. And I believe very strongly when I was first minister that we in Scotland we needed more more cultural diversity. We needed more of an injection of new talent and people from elsewhere in the world if Scotland was going to become more entrepreneurial and more economically successful. And we, that was reflected in our agreements at that time with the Home Office, when particularly when uh, David Blunkett was the uh, was the Home Secretary. And I think it's possible to. Ha, uh, to, to, to find ways in which um, that desire is accommodated within the UK immigration system once all the powers are properly repatriated to the UK. The other area I would mention, though, is in, in, in trade agreements, which is a whole new, new area for the, for the UK government to deal with. And you know, there, are, there are specific industries in Scotland, like the whisky industry, um, where I don't think it would be out with the, uh, the brain power of everybody involved, um, to find ways in which the Scottish Government might be engaged in some of the uh, international uh, trade discussions that would particularly affect the whisky industry, for example. So I think there are ways of working collaboratively, and for the UK Government to signal to Scotland that it wants to work collaboratively with these desires, um, and, and uh, if the will is there to do so. And I, th I think the key, thing is, the key issue here is psychological, in my view. Every time Prime Ministers and other senior figures in the UK Government talk about Scotland in the last 15 years, they are reacting defensively to a situation they see emerging and they feel is potentially getting out of control. And they need instead, in my view, to, to embrace the diversity of the UK and find positive solutions rather than try and be defensive and 
try and find some one nation that no longer exists. Then, on powers more generally, I would say, um, I mean, I, 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 mean I, I almost make this as a plea, because I see there's already a debate opening up about the powers of the Scottish Parliament and speeches being made and so on. Um, there's a very tight timetable here. There's a lot of work to be done. And it's only uh, um, about a year from our agreement of the last set of new powers for the Scottish Parliament, uh, many of which have not been used yet, some of which have not even been triggered yet. Um, and so it seems to me that, uh, that the best thing to do for the next two years uh, is, to, um, is to repatriate those powers from, from the European Union um, uh, within the bounds of the current devolution settlement in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, those settlements were designed for absolute clarity. There was a reason for the reserved uh, uh, powers system. The reserved powers system provided more clarity than, um, than a list of devolved powers. Because what it, uh, what it said was, if the power is not reserved, then it is automatically devolved. And that was a, uh, that was a very clear principle that was agreed back in 1997. Um, and it has worked in practice ever since. There have been almost no, I mean, I think you can count on, on one hand, the number of cases that have been uh, 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 since then where there's been a dispute about who has the power to do something between Edinburgh and London, uh, in terms of a legal dispute as opposed to a political dispute. Um, and so I think, that, I think that works. I think it will be obvious which European powers um, repatriated to the UK are reserved and everything else should then be devolved. Um, uh, and I, I mean, there are obvious examples in all of that, fishing, agriculture, and so on. Uh, on one side, um, uh, international trade on the other. But I then think there needs to be a positive approach by both governments um, to describe how they will use those new additional powers um, and use them in a cooperative way. And I think if the UK government was to say, you know, we want the Scottish government, Welsh government, or the Irish executive um, to work with us cooperatively on things like a common fisheries policy for the UK. But also, we will work cooperative, cooperatively with them. So where we have the power, like in trade, we will engage the Scottish government in our discussions on that, on whisky, for example, in the same way as UPREP in Brussels would always have involved Scotland House, our office in Brussels, in those discussions at the European Union level and ensured that Scottish interests were represented in those discussions. Uh, so I think and both, if both sides are positive, they can find ways of making cooperation work within the current but, settlement. But in, in the new situation, if you take agriculture, for example, uh, because of the principle that if it's not reserved, it is devolved, agriculture is a, uh, has hitherto been uh, a Scottish government responsibility, but of course it's been overridden by uh, Europe requiring uh, the whole of the United Kingdom to observe certain regulations and, uh, uh, and certain uh, conditions for expenditure. Uh, when that goes, there would, be an argue, there would be a discussion as to whether, in, even in that area, some reserve power should be reinvented. Um, do you see that as being a real issue or as, a, uh, as something we just have to negotiate our way through? Um, when clearly the, the regulatory power could actually undermine the single market within the United Kingdom in certain uh, I, hmm. well that, uh, that, that can I go back to my very uh, uh, my point in my opening statement here about um, precisely those kind of issues where there will be um, there will be those who will say that the reserve power that is the single market of the UK or, you know, as trade um, uh, overrides the, uh, the, the precedent of devolving agriculture or fisheries or whatever. Um, uh, uh, and on the other side, there will be those who will say that um, the fact that agricultural fisheries or whatever is currently devolved um, means that um, uh, anything that's in any way associated with that should be automatically devolved. Um, there will be, uh, I think, uh, space for um, genuine disagreement, not just political posing, but genuine disagreement or dispute on the interpretation of that 
settlement. Um, and, that, and, and in that situation, I think there needs to be uh, uh, an alternative route to the legal dispute that might then lead to constant challenges in the court in the, in the Supreme Court. Um, and, I, and that's why I, I mean I would suggest uh, um, the appointment of you know I, I mean it could be for example a senior judge who served on the Supreme Court uh, from Scotland or whatever. Um, but I think you could have or maybe three if people wanted to be sure about this. There are there are Scottish judges who've served at the European level. Um, uh, you, know, you could easily have, say, three judges, one of whom has spent all their time in the Scottish legal system and at the Court of Session in Edinburgh, one of whom has served on the Supreme Court and one of whom served on the European Court. You could have three judges given the job of adjudicating or at least recommending an adjudication in a situation where there's a dispute about the interpretation of that definition of reserves in relation to some of those issues that affect single market or trade and specific uh, policy responsibilities, and I think that I think getting that agreed now would save an awful lot of grief further down the road. Lady Full, please chip in and then come back to Paul. Just to pick up that point of the adjudication mechanism, because that's a really interesting one at the European level as well. as here. So, how would you see the English, Welsh, and Irish interests represented? Well, I think I, I think the situation. Um, the interesting situation about devolution mm. in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland mm. um, is that each of the three devolved settlements is very specific yeah. for that territory, for that jurisdiction. And, um, and so I think if, if, if the same issues were to uh, be likely to arise in Wales or Northern Ireland, then there's no reason why you couldn't have an, 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 also an adjudication <coughs> mechanism for them. But I think a separate, machine a separate, separate, one. separate one. I think the, the three devolved settlements are very much an agreement between yeah. the people of those uh, and three smaller nations in the UK and the UK as a whole, as represented by the UK government there and the UK Parliament. And I think those three individual settlements have a, um, uh, a, 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 have a very distinct element in each of them that needs to be reflected in any of the mechanisms as well as the, the final decisions in this process. Back to Lord Whitty, if we may. Um, a slightly separate question. You partly covered this in your answer to the Lord Chairman a bit earlier. That, um, do you think that in its present state, the Scottish administrative structure is capable of taking on these, has the capacity effectively to taking on these uh, areas? And also, you interestingly started talking about the interrelationship between members of the Scottish Civil Service and Whitehall. I have to tell you that when we asked the question of various people in Edinburgh, uh, they all said there has been no member of the Scottish Civil Service, Scottish administration, seconded into <coughs> any of the Brexit departments, which struck us as peculiar. Uh, and you're making a much more general point, but uh, I don't know if you'd like to comment on the general issue of capacity, but also this interchange that you were beginning to develop earlier. Um, I can uh, uh, hopefully comment even m much more briefly on this than I've done perhaps on the other, on the other issues. I, I think there, are, uh, there, will be the, there will be the same issues, maybe not exactly on the full scale, but the same issues of capacity for new responsibilities in the Scottish Government as there are going to be in the UK Government in relation to trade and, and so on. Um, so yes, of course, there will be a need for an additional new capacity and, and, and some new skills, and it may be the, those skills exist in uh, British civil servants are currently working in uh, Brussels, but uh, certainly the Scottish Government needs to think about that, think about it quickly. Um, I think the issue of interchange is really important and it has broken down, partly as a result of the breakdown in relations between the two levels of government over the last 10 years. But that, um, uh, you know, I do believe that embedding civil, the civil servants on each side would be really helpful, even if it's behind Chinese walls. I think it would be really good to do. Um, and I think the other thing is, is the issue of capacity here, because I do not believe that the current scale of the, of the Advocate General's office will be able to deal with the number of issues um, that affect the Scottish legal system um, that will arise during these Brexit negotiations over the next two years. You know, we have an almost entirely separate civil and criminal law in Scotland. Um, and you, know, you cannot deal with that with a few civil servants in the, in the department of one minister. Um, you know, so that will have to be built into this as well in, in London as well as in Edinburgh. Thank you. Um, Baroness Brown. Thank you. 
great uh, repeal bill. How do you see the devolved legislatures playing their role in this? Um, will they need to legislate in parallel, or would it be sufficient for them to indicate their assent by something like a legislative consent motion? And what happens if there is um, no consent forthcoming on certain matters? Or bill? I have to, when, I, when I looked at the, at the, 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 your list of possible questions that I might be asked today, this is the one that I, had, I, gave, I had to give most thought to, I have to say. Um, having had the tortuous experience of discussing these legislative consent motions on a regular basis uh, um, back, back in my years as a minister, uh, they were always difficult decisions. And that balancing act between the right thing to do and what you can actually achieve politically in the Scottish Parliament is always there. Um, I think uh, uh, I think there's a very real potential, particularly if the Scottish Parliament has asked for a second independence referendum, and the UK government has said no or not yet. Um, I think there's a very real possibility that the Scottish Parliament, uh, in its current makeup, might then use the legislative consent motion process, or even a great repeal bill in the Scottish Parliament, um, as uh, given the deadlines we're all trying to work towards here, um, as, a, a, as a challenge to the UK government in all of this. Um, and perhaps understandably do that if they, if they have the, the, the opportunity to do so. I, 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 uh, I can see why they would, they would maybe want to do so. Um, and so I come back to my uh, uh, original statement really here because I think I think if there is not clarity and transparency in the negotiations which exposes both sides to full accountability in the positions that they are adopting between the UK government and the Scottish government um, and if there is not some process of adjudication on some of those issues about powers that might might then arise um, then I think we will find ourselves in 12 18 months time facing the prospect of the Scottish Parliament and the UK Parliament disagreeing, challenges in the, court, in the Supreme Court, um, and perhaps the, the whole timetable being derailed. So I, I would come back to the, the, the issue that we need to resolve how we're going to resolve these differences now, so that at the end of the day, if there is a great repeal bill in Scotland, perhaps coupled with some legislative consent motions, it might need to be both. Um, then that has been that has been agreed publicly and transparently, and nobody can then go back on the on the deal okay. on either side. A, 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 apart from the um, uh, proposed referendum for independence, uh, are there any other hot spots that you identify that might be the key sticking points? Well, I think. Um, uh, I am concerned about this issue of the the, the impact um, that, that, that all of this has on the distinctive criminal and civil law in Scotland, and I and I, 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 I uh, based on the experience of the last um, eighteen years, um, I am not convinced that with everything that they are uh, facing, the UK government will be alert to. Uh, all of the implications for the Scots criminal and civil law um, that they uh, will need to take on board. And therefore, it would be very, uh, I think, very easy to see um, the possibility that at the end, towards the end of this process, a number of issues arise that have just simply not been thought through properly. Um, and that comes back to the issue of capacity that was raised, raised a minute ago. You know, I, 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 if, and I think in this in this process where there is it's not, this is not like a normal political process where you can just put it off for six months. You know, there is a t there's a deadline here, and these 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 new laws will have to be passed. So, um, scaling up the capacity right now needs attention uh, at both ends um, of the uh, of the M1. Um, uh, and, and, and having an adjudication mechanism and a transparency in the process, um, I think, needs to be dealt with now 
because if, the, if, if these issues arise in 12 months' time, it might be too late to, to resolve them properly. And, you know, I, I, I sat in, in the Scottish Parliament in, in uh, I was Finance Minister, I wasn't First Minister at the time, in August uh, uh, 1999. Um, and we always talk about the first bill that was passed by the Scottish Parliament, the first act being the one that I, I put to Parliament to set up the financial rules and regulations, the Public Finance and Accountability Act. But actually the first act that was passed by the Scottish Parliament was a piece of emergency legislation that arose because um, a, a legal technicality um, uh, uh, had led to the release of a prisoner, if I remember, if I remember rightly, um, who was deemed to be dangerous, and we had to act very quickly in order to fill that, um, that gap um, in, in the legislation. And uh, you know, I worry that if the Scottish legal provisions are not properly accounted for in these discussions, and there's a mix-up in the final month or so of the passing of the Great Repeal Bill, then um, you know, you could, there could be mistakes that could have, could have quite serious consequences. So we need to get our act together on this. Do you have the impression that there's any significant body of opinion, either in London or Edinburgh or both, um, which is buying into your ideas on transparency and dispute resolution? Um, not yet, but I'm an optimist. <laughs> That's a short answer, and I got the point. Um, I think at that point we'll go on to Michael J. Thank you, Mr. Um, I, I wanted really, in a way, it's summing up what you said so far is whether you think that the British government, is the UK government, is doing enough to take into account the, uh, and reflect the different interests of the devolved administrations. The first question, but secondly, is whether you think that the Joint Ministerial Committee, which we've heard quite a bit, is, um, is the vehicle for doing that. I mean, the, 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 the implication we've rather heard rather up, up to now is that London seems to speak rather highly of the Joint Ministerial Committee, but when we ask people in Edinburgh, Cardiff or Belfast, they seem to be rather dismissive of it. And I just wondered where where you stood on, on that too? Um, I was never a fan of these committees, I have to say. Probably the most sceptical person in, 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 uh, involved with them. The only one I ever found to be particularly useful um, was an internal UK government, uh, GMC, which was the one in Europe, um, that was chaired by the Europe Minister, um, including, including during, uh, during your time as, uh, uh, as head of the diplomatic service. And those... But that's because that that that, uh, that GMC, in my view, had a had a had a function. It was partly the swapping, the, the exchange of information. It was partly a, agreeing and understanding the UK government's line on certain issues and looking ahead to the issues debates on the constitution at the time and so on. Um, I, I I have to say I find the other. Um, if, I think if people are honest about the other GMCs um, that that involve the devolved administrations, then. Um, they are either seen as a chore uh, or they are seen as an, a, a political opportunity. Um, and neither of those two psychologies seems to me to, to fit the bill on this, on this particular business. So there needs to be a GMC European negotiations, as there is, because there needs to be some mechanism uh, to pull, pull together. But um, I, don't, I don't think that is sufficient at all for the depth of discussion that needs to take place here. And, I, and I, I, I don't know enough about the procedures to know if yeah. people, are, if they are presenting papers from each side and going through the detail slot by slot. But I, I think there needs to be um, civil servant to civil servant, minister to minister, direct negotiations for each of the three devolved nations in the UK. Um, and uh, the, 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 the papers and the agreements from those discussions could then be ratified by a GMC, European negotiations that then goes up through the process in Whitehall or whatever, but I think that bilateral agreement is critical for for the uh, to, to be to get right into the detail of this, as opposed to the general processes what, and strategy, which is really what we've been talking about so far. So the GMC, the the, the, the GMC for uh, on EU negotiations would be a sort of ratifying what had been sorted out bilaterally with the three different administrations separately. We have recording agreements to then process through the system. 
yeah. And the idea of cross posting to which you referred earlier could be relevant to this in that um, yes. there would be um, representatives of the Scottish Government in the Cabinet Office who could walk down the corridor and say, we need to sort this out. That's, you know, so there's the informal yes. working level contact, then going through for, um, uh, for as it were, conclusion or ratification by the JMC. Yes. The end. Thank you. Uh, I think if we may, we're going to Baroness Prussia. Very much indeed. I want to talk a little bit about the interparliamentary dialogue mechanisms mm. between Westminster and the legislature. Do you think the existing arrangements are adequate or do you think something more is needed to meet the challenges of Brexit? Um, the first thing I would say about this is I'm, I'm not certain what arrangements are currently in place, so I, I, um, my comments are maybe not as, as, as full in this respect as it, I would like them to be. And I'm also not sure how involved the Speaker and the, uh, and the various committee chairs in the Westminster Parliament are involved with the government in talking about how they will process this great... I, mean, I presume there are discussions taking place um, about how you create the parliamentary time and so on, but I, I mean, I would assume that, but I don't know for certain. But what would you um, ideally like to see? Ideally, I would like to see uh, early discussions between um, the Speaker and the presiding officer in Scotland, and I presume that would be the case in Wales and Northern Ireland. Even in the, even in the current situation in Northern Ireland, these discussions should be happening. Um, I, I, uh, and I would like to see, at least in preparation, um, uh, uh, a, a, a system in the Scottish Parliament that would, that would mirror the system that is being developed to deal with this great repeal bill here in the UK Parliament. Um, you know, there are all sorts of issues here. <clears throat> here there, are <clears throat> there are issues in the Scottish Parliament about uh, the parliamentary timetable. It, it meets in different months of the year, for example. Um, it, uh, so if there was a, you know, a, a, a parallel bill, um, at what point in the year would that be being discussed? And would it get out of sync at some point? And would that cause any difficulty? Um, uh, but I think the Scottish Parliament will need, to, will need to change its committee structure. It does not have the Select Committee um, uh, Bill Committee uh, divide that, that exists here in the UK Parliament. It has combined committees that um, I have been critical of in the past, but they do exist. Um, so they're going to have to find a way of creating the legislative um, uh, discussions within those committees that will that will deal with any 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 bill that might come along. So I think a lot of preparation is going to be required, and I think the best place to start in that would be perhaps some kind of joint working group set up by the presiding officer and the speaker, again for each of the three administrations, three parliaments and assemblies, that would lead, um, uh, that would, it would engage them starting right now and not leaving it to once the government's come up with plans and proposals further down the, further down the road. Thank you very much. Could we even look at, in, at least potentially and maybe somewhat in the future, could we even look at things jointly? As a, I mean, as a London-based select committee with a devolved um, assembly which had a particular interest in the area. I, um, I, I have absolutely no in principle objection to that. Um, I think there are, the, the situation is complicated by the decision that was made back in, actually almost before the Scottish Parliament was created. It was made in 98, really. By, um, by the ministers in the then Scottish office that there would be this, um, this hybrid system of committee, which means that we don't have um, the sort of exploratory, investigative select committee style that might work. But I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't create, as we have created in, in these two houses, hybrid committees that share the membership of, of, of both houses. And, um, I, I think it would be a really interesting experiment to try and do, do that on a, on a UK... If, let me give you an example. If, to go back to Lord Whitty's questions, if we were looking at a common agricultural policy or a common fisheries policy for the UK, where each of the devolved nations has its own responsibilities and the UK government has its responsibilities for England and perhaps some overview, um, the, you know, would there be a case for having a joint parliamentary committee looking at what that policy might look like in practice, rather than the four parliaments doing their own thing 
while the four governments are trying to work together. And I think that would be quite an interesting idea. Um, but, but, but perhaps two years down the road rather than right now. Thank you. Final question, formally, Bill Green. Thank you. Uh, looking in the other direction, across the channel, um, how far do you think that the EU, um, collectively and individually at the member state level, understand the subtleties and the importance of some of the issues that affect the devolved administrations? You said earlier, and we would all agree, of course, that there are very distinctive situations in the three, and perhaps we should leave Northern Ireland aside for the purpose of this question and really, I guess, focus primarily on Scotland. How far do you think that, not really Brussels and the machinery in Brussels, but the member states more generally who will be important in the process, or certainly at the end of the process, understand the aspirations and the particular issues that are of concern to the Scottish people and the Scottish Government? I think that level of understanding is, is, um, is different in different member states of the European Union. You know, there's a very acute understanding in Spain. Um, there's quite a good understanding in Germany, not least because their second chamber is based on representation from, their, uh, the, the, from the lander, as is, as is the case in Austria. Um, uh, the, there's a degree of understanding in, in, in Belgium, but perhaps more at the evolved level than necessarily the, uh, uh, the central government level, um, and, and, and in one or two other places as well. Perhaps less so with a very different sort of regional system in France, for example, uh, um, and, and, and maybe one or two of the Eastern European, uh, uh, former Eastern European countries. Um, I, I, uh, I was involved in a very interesting group um, when, when I was First Minister called uh, which is called the Conference of Legislative Regions of Europe, and we uh, we were kind of established as part of the um, the debate on the, the EU constitution to see if there could be a role for those regions that were not administrative regions but were in fact legislative regions uh, in, in, in those uh, within those countries that had those, those systems. Um, and we formed a group and we met for four or five years, and it, 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 it following the Lisbon Treaty. It, it, it kind of drifted away, really, as an institution. Um, and I, I had the, the privilege of being president of it in 2004. Um, but it, but it, it involved Catalonia, Bavaria, um, some of the other German lander, uh, Salzburg in, in, in Austria, um, Wallonia and Flanders in Belgium, and, 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 and so on. Um, and, uh, and, and so these issues do exist elsewhere in Europe, and there is therefore a there is an understanding in the EU Council um, that these issues have to be addressed, but not always a positive understanding. Sometimes, you know, it is an even more defensive reaction the UK government takes. Um, I think in Germany they would be more open to uh, having a, a decent discussion about this, and in Spain they would be very closed uh, for understandable, uh, understandable reasons. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is that I think Michel Barnier has an understanding of this. I found Michel Barnier... Um, I wouldn't want to, to, to be derogatory to anybody else, but um, my exchanges with Michel Barnier when he was an EU Commissioner to this day were, were the best exchanges I had with, a, with an EU Commissioner. Um, he was on top of his brief, he understood Europe and its complexities, he was always negotiating hard, but he was always trying, working out in his head where the final solution would come. Um, you know, he he managed to negotiate Western Europe um, declining, uh, so Western Europe having a, re a reduced level of European regional development funds uh, in order to accommodate the new countries of Eastern Europe coming in. Uh, he managed to negotiate that with agreement. Probably the, you know, one of the few people to actually reduce an EU budget in Western Europe. Um, you know, this is a very skilled operator who understands the complexity of Europe, and I, I, and I feel confident that he understands Scotland, because I, in my previous experience with him, I've certainly found that to be the case. Very good interlocutor. On that, Rish, no two. Lady Faulkner, do you want to come in? I want to take you a little bit further in that conversation. Mm -hmm. And to what you've mentioned, Germany in particular, where I, I agree with you broadly that because of their own federal structure, they're much more open to this. 
But do you think that the current Scottish administration has done, has done a calculation of who may be where in terms of it actually trying to be part of the European architecture outside, beyond Brexit? And do you think Germany would be on side there? I know that Spain wouldn't, for example. You've been very clear about that yourself. Um, my view on this is that I don't think you can, you, can, you can completely avoid the rules. If there was an independent Scotland, or if Scotland voted to be independent, um, I don't think you can completely avoid the rules. And the rules are that you don't just become the successor state. Um, and that's, to me, that's pretty clear. But also, I don't think you can avoid the political reality. And if Scotland was an independent country, and if Scotland wanted to be a member of the European Union, then, then I think the European Union would find a way of dealing with that pretty quickly. Um, so I, I, you know, I, think, I think there's both rules and there's political reality. Both would come into play, but a decade from now we would look back and say, oh, that was sorted. I think the issue is, is it desirable? Um, it's not, I, I, I think we need to, to me, too much of the last independence referendum was about um, what people might be stopped from doing. I think it's what's desirable is the issue here. And I think, uh, I hope if there is to be a second independence referendum at some point in the next decade, then it is based on what is desirable rather than what, is, uh, what somebody is ruling on at that particular time. Lord Southgate. Yeah. Well, Chairman, uh, can I follow up on the point which you made uh, from the Chair about a joint uh, committee um, could, could operate? And uh, my understanding was, in principle, you wouldn't disagree. Uh, would I be correct in saying that the JMC has joint ministerial committee hasn't been a success, mainly for political considerations, because the SNP wanted independence and therefore wanted to short circuit that committee? But if um, now they've lost their overall majority, if they, allow, if, if they lose their majority altogether, um, could there be a scope for a joint committee acting um, in much the same way that a joint select committee of both houses of parliament does in this parliament and, for example, did in the deregulation bill? It may be an interesting thing in the, in the in, in, as part of this discussion over the next uh, two years, it might be an interesting thing to have a, a mechanism where those who are carrying the burden of parliamentary scrutiny, so if there is a chair of, or maybe two or three chairs of the main committees in the House of Commons dealing with the Brexit um, uh, preparations and the legislation, and there is a chair or a couple of chairs in the Scottish Parliament doing that, it might be interesting for them to have a regular mechanism where they are talking to each other and, uh, uh, and liaising. I do think the issue of joint um, select committees, informally or formally, is perhaps beyond this process, but not as something I would count out in the longer term. Well, thank you for that. If no colleague has any further questions, um, I think we've all found that incredibly helpful. Have you anything else you'd like to add? Well, I'm very happy. Thank you very much. Well, if not, may we thank you formally on behalf of the committee, remind you that we'll send a transcript forward, and um, we would very much like to keep in touch with you formally or informally, as you feel convenient in what I think will be a fast-moving and challenging situation for us all. So at that point, I'll conclude the public evidence session. Thank you.